So today's talk is entitled Spoiler Alert. If you have a sports team and you had to DVR the, the game or the match and you don't want anybody to tell you what it is, you try to avoid any conversations, you won't look at your phone, you won't turn on the radio because you don't want them to spoil the outcome. Um, if, if you're reading a story or watching a movie or maybe uh, binging a series on Netflix, you don't want anybody to tell you in advance some things that are going to happen. It's a spoiler alert. And uh, so today is a spoiler alert. And uh, uh, first of all, when we're talking about Jesus, in case you haven't heard this or read it yet, uh, he died. Uh, the main character of Scripture died. Uh, the other spoiler alert about that is he rose uh, from the dead. I've got some other spoiler alerts, unfortunately, for you. One is uh, you are also going to die. <laughs> if, you, some, if you haven't figured that out yet, it will happen to you. The mortality rate right now is at 100% and has been that way for quite some time. And it is also true that for those who follow Christ, you will live again. And uh, that truth usually only gets talked about at funerals and Easter. And yet today we're going to look, the Apostle Paul had some amazing things to say about this truth and how it affects our everyday life. So we are in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and he starts this chapter by saying, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. The point I'd like us to kind of permeate our thinking today is this, that the truth of the resurrection makes a difference in this life, not just the afterlife. This is not one of those messages where you're going to be encouraged to try to do better for a longer period of time in hopes that you eventually wind up in a place of eternal reward. We're going to talk a lot about how life gets lived out every day here. And uh, uh, your, your thinking about, your, your dependence on this truth is going to have a lot of impact on how much joy and hope you actually have in life. If the resurrection is not true, if the resurrection of Christ is not true, Paul makes a couple of statements in this chapter. One is, then Christians have nothing to say, and the other is, whatever Jesus said doesn't matter. The resurrection is the foundation stone on which the entire faith of Christianity is built. And uh, when you look at people who don't agree with any religion or maybe with the Christian religion, uh, virtually no one argues that Jesus was not an historical figure. Uh, there is virtually no one who says he's just a myth. He was a man who did live. They, they acknowledge that, and they acknowledge that he died. Where the disagreement comes is whether or not he raised from the dead. And we're introduced to some interesting concepts here where uh, Paul lets us know that this, this idea of Jesus dying, that that was actually part of God's redemptive plan, that this wasn't something gone horribly wrong. But this is actually something that God intended. And what we see here is that Jesus was pronounced dead. Sometimes we think that because 
ancient cultures lacked technology. They were unable to tell when someone was dead. Uh, they, they were very good at telling when someone was dead. In fact, they could probably do a better job of it than we could. We're very far removed from people who, uh, whose life is expiring. Uh, he was buried, but not in just some random grave that people didn't know where he was. He was actually buried in the personal tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. People knew exactly where it was. And there were Roman soldiers that were placed as guards outside and a stone that was rolled across the front of the mouth of the tomb in order to seal it up so that no one could enter or leave. We also know that on Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. There are eyewitnesses that went there and observed this. And there were over 500 people who are actually eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. And the church itself became so incredibly powerful, it, you couldn't intimidate them or terrorize them in any way. You could threaten to take their life, and they would just look at you and say, yeah, you did that to the one we follow, and he's fine. <laughs> you, you couldn't terrorize them. And here's the thing about that, that whole thing. There are lots of people, especially around Easter, there's some channels on television that just kind of focus on, you know, what they perceive as misrepresentations of the Easter story and how it's really more a spiritual story or, or a myth or something like that. Here's what I want you to know. There has been not a single theory put forward that takes those facts into account that gives an explanation. If, if it was a mistaken grave, then how could they see a resurrected Christ? If it was a stolen body, then why would people actually give their life for something they knew was a lie? I mean, at the end of the day, there is no theory that holds up to the facts other than Jesus raised from the dead. And that made them unstoppable. So the resurrection of Jesus was something that occurred in the past, but it influences our present and it determines our future. So Paul begins to talk about a couple of things that are critical. And the first thing he identifies is that the grace of God actually gave him a new identity. A new identity. What he had been in the past now becomes decentered from who he perceives himself to be. He calls himself the least of the apostles. Why does he say he's the least? He says he's the least because he actually persecuted the church. He was responsible for the arrest, the trial, and many believe the execution of people who named Jesus. He was trying to stomp this faith out. And this is the most astonishing thing Paul discovered. For all that he was doing against Christ and against the church, including murder, for everything that he was doing, he came in contact with the grace of God, and the grace of God was greater than the sins that he was committing against God and against the church or against any other person. This is absolutely astonishing because many people believe that their sins are actually greater than the grace of God. This is a guy who did a lot of things that all of us would think would be out of bounds and wrong, and yet he discovered that the grace of God was greater than his sin. But it doesn't stop there. He says that this grace was not wasted on him. He actually talks about how he begins to live in a way that's transformed because this grace came into his life. And he's able to accept who he is. He doesn't hide the fact that he was the guy responsible for persecuting the church. He acknowledges it. Do you know how rare that is? How few people can actually just be honest about who they are. So many people spend so much of their lives managing the impressions of others, trying to appear to be something that we are not, because we are almost certain if people knew us for who we really are, they would reject us. And Paul, because of the grace of God, is just able to, to say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so Christ gave this perfect, he lived this perfect life, and that's why we're accepted of God, because he transfers that perfection, that record of perfection to us. Christ died, and because of that, we don't have to fear the punishment of God because he took all the punishment from God. And Christ raised from the dead, and that lets us know that death itself is defeated. This was a huge deal. I mean, when you think about this, death is the one thing we're all afraid of. And people who say they're not afraid of it, when they actually have an opportunity to experience it, they think twice about it. Like, you know, have you ever heard this? There's like something like 40% of people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of death. I don't believe it. I believe if you give them a choice, they'll have something to say. 
I do. It's just, that's what I think. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Not only does the grace of God give you a new identity, it animates you. It puts you into action. The grace of God enables you to live your life to the full. The grace of God does not make a person lazy. The grace of God doesn't make a person withdraw. The grace of God doesn't paralyze a person. It helps them to deeply engage in life rather than avoid it. This is a really big deal. Uh, for example, uh, there are some people that the way they navigate life is they're constantly trying to be first or put themselves first because they feel like that's the only way they can get what they want in life. But a person who doesn't want to be first, they often withdraw. Here's the thing. In the gospel, in grace, we don't have to try to be first because we've already received all the blessings and benefits God has for us. So to be present is enough, but we don't withdraw like, oh, somebody else will always get it. We got it. We experience the grace of God for ourselves. And sacrificial love, we're able to offer sacrificial love because we have received sacrificial love. So what kind of life could you live if you truly believed that you were fully accepted by God and that he completely loved you? How would that change the way you live your everyday life? Um, this is a really big deal. So we're going to look at two beliefs that lots of people have that kind of paralyze their capacity to live this way. And the first belief is the belief that you are not loved, or even worse, the belief that you are unlovable. You're not loved. If you feel like you are not loved, there are places you will not go. There are many things you will not do. And, uh, but if you believe you are loved or that you are in love, uh, that's a game changer. People in love act differently. People in love act a little weird. I mean, let's just be honest. Young men who are not known for their fashion sense or their personal hygiene all of a sudden start presenting themselves in ways that is confusing to their parents. Which is, who's that and why is he acting that way? Money that used to be spent on recreation now gets spent on relation. Just that capacity to do something with someone rather than just consume it myself. It's a big deal. Love makes a difference. So the belief that you are not loved paralyzes us, and the belief that things will not get better. This is horribly paralyzing to us. If nothing's ever going to get better, then why should I even bother? I mean, every failure is just one more piece of proof that nothing's going to improve. Without hope, you don't have anything. Nothing's going to get better, so now you just have to cling to whatever you have, because Everything you lose, you lose. And this is horribly paralyzing in people's lives. A lot of people, that's their whole life. That's their game plan. This is how they function. They're just trying not to lose what they have. Is that really a great way to live? And they, they have this fear that just permeates them. So once you realize that whatever you lose actually doesn't define you or destroy you, that's a huge game changer. That, that you can work not to earn something, but just because you're grateful. That's a completely different way to think. So the Apostle Paul identifies for us some really helpful things. This is how the resurrection is just not about the afterlife, but about your everyday life. What difference does the resurrection make in your everyday life? And the first is that it helps you face your fears. It helps you face your fears. Some of us have more fears than other but I don't know anyone who's actually fearless. We all have things that we're afraid of. Some of us are afraid of failing because then people will label us a failure. Some of us are afraid of loss. And by the way, not just of things. Sometimes we're afraid of losing people. If, if a relationship breaks up, there are some people who seem to lose their sense of identity because that loss is more than they can bear. There are other folks that when, when you experience that moment in life when someone you dearly love passes away, they die. This can be a devastating thing to experience. And for some people, that fear of loss, it's just, you know, I'll tell you what, if you have a parent that is af afraid uh, that something will, could happen to their children, they'll be super, super, super protective. And that protection will just suffocate the life out of that child. And that child will grow up to resent the parent. And it's just absolutely how, how stifling this kind of life can be. 
We have to face our fears. Some people are afraid of being known. If someone knew me for who I was, they would reject me. Very powerful fear that people have in their lives. And so they constantly manage the impressions of other people. And this is what I want you to know. You, you pretending to be someone, you'll always feel like you just have pretend friends. Because it's not the real you that people are responding to. And the resurrection just deals a death blow to our fears. Because if death can be conquered, can't everything else be conquered? I mean, like, that's the ultimate enemy. And if that enemy can be conquered, then certainly there are other enemies that can be conquered. The second thing, and this will surprise you, if you believe in the resurrection, it actually helps you live healthier. Paul tells us in this chapter, beginning in verse 32, this is what he says. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? Then he says, this is, if you don't believe in resurrection, then this is what you're left with. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Just nothing else. And do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you want and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. This is a fascinating passage of Scripture. What Paul is saying is, if there's nothing after this life, if there's nothing else to look forward to, then you only have really two motivators in life. One is to survive, and the other is to indulge. I just want to live another day, and I might as well enjoy whatever's in front of me, because after all, I don't know when it's going to happen again, and I just want to get what I can while I can, because I'm probably not going to get it again. And people live like this, and it's absolutely terrifying. So you just, you might as well eat, you might as well drink, because tomorrow we're going to die. Now let me ask, how many here have eaten already today? The Bible is not saying that those who believe in the resurrection don't eat. <laughs> that, that would be silly. That's not what it's saying. What it is saying is there is a way to eat and drink that is destructive to our lives. There's a way to do everything in life that's destructive to our life. And here's what causes it. It's this concept that says things are never going to be better than they are right now, and whatever I do isn't going to make a difference. And those two things will destroy your life. You will go into survival mode, and you will go to, into indulgence mode, and you will never climb out of the hole that you are in. It's one of the most terrifying places for people to be. And Paul says, when you think like that, you will hang around other people who think like that, and you will all just be eating and drinking and indulging whatever you can, because nothing's going to get any better, and nothing's going to make a difference. And Paul says, that's what the sin is. It's not just what you're doing. It's the attitude that says, nothing can get any better than it is right now, and nothing that I do will ever make a difference. And that is has been dealt a death blow by Jesus who insists that when we take steps of faith, it makes all the difference in the world. That's the point. And so we actually wind up living healthier because, you know, how many have ever heard, eh, never mind. <laughs> no, that would go, you don't want to be here five extra minutes, right? You can say right. <laughs> so that leads us to the third thing. If you believe in the, in the resurrection, and you can actually handle suffering better in day-to-day -day life. You can actually handle suffering better. Now, I know some people want a faith that eliminates suffering from your life. That place is called heaven, and this is not that place. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes this life can be wonderful, but every one of us experienced some pretty painful things in this world. You're not going to get through life without suffering. The Bible is clear on this. Jesus was clear on this. Jesus said, in this world, you will have many tribulations. The Bible is crystal clear. We're, we're not, this is not an escape clause. This is not storm avoidance. You, you can't get away from this thing. Suffering is part of our broken and dark world. And here's the thing. So what do, we, what do people do with their suffering? And what our culture is incredibly good at is we medicate our suffering. We don't like to feel bad. And so there are ways we can medicate our bad feelings so that they don't feel as bad, or maybe we just feel numb for a while, or maybe we even feel good for a little bit. And so we just keep medicating ourselves. And here's the problem. When you medicate the feelings of the suffering that you're going through, the suffering doesn't change. You actually wind up staying in it longer. 
We had a student that was part of our church family, and she was working for a company that was just not a good company, and the boss was a terrible boss. And she would go to work, and she, she just despised having to work there, but it was, she had to pay the bills. This is what you do. And one day, I mean, this guy went way over the line, and she went home, and the easiest thing in the world is to open the lid on something or light something or do something that just veggies you out by the hours so you can at least forget what a terrible life you have when you go to work. And instead, she went online and applied for 10 internships, and one of them said yes, and she took that internship, which turned into a new job, and that had benefits and good pay, and that led to even better things down the road for her. If she had just gone home and medicated herself, she'd still be in that abysmal place. This is what our culture does. Every time we medicate ourselves, we keep ourselves one day longer in something that God intended the pain to drive us out of. Don't do that. That is not healthy for you. See, we realize this suffering that I'm going through has not defined me and it's not going to destroy me. It's letting me know that there's a step I need to take in my life right now. That's a really big deal. That, that is a huge insight in Scripture. The challenge is when we're going through suffering, we feel like they're just road signs to the fact that we're getting closer to death, like decline, decay, disintegration, deterioration, loss. We just feel like I'm getting closer to that horrible thing called death. But please understand this, and this is what surprises us, is that in death, God uses death of Jesus in order to produce his redemptive plan. Most of the experiences of transformation that we have in our life will actually come in moments of crisis. Life seems to flow out of the very situations that feel like death. That's why this is so critically important. We can better handle suffering. Look at what Paul says here. He says, when you sow, you do not just plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else, but God gives it a body as he is determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Well, what's he saying there? Say, Pastor, you lost me. Wait, 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 hang on. This is actually really important. If you took a little seed of corn and you went out and you planted it, how many know you don't expect what comes out of the ground to be another, just a little seed of corn? That would be a huge waste of time. I planted this little seed, and I got a little seed. Well, you already had a seed. Now you lost one to get another one. That's not a gain. But if you plant that little seed of corn, it turns into a whole stalk of corn, which has ears of corn on it. And this time of year, how many know the corn has been really good? Yeah. So I've been enjoying the corn. A, a, a farmer would be incredibly disappointed if what came out of the ground was what he put in the ground. And this is what we think. We think that what we feel like is being buried in our life, if anything comes out of it, it's going to look just like what is getting buried. And Paul says that's not how God works. He doesn't do it that way in the natural, and he doesn't do it that way in the supernatural. What you think is going to be buried will actually come out as something substantially more and something substantially more glorious than you could possibly imagine. That's what he's saying. So when you understand that, you still experience the pain of suffering, but it doesn't have the same effect on you because the resurrection power of Christ is making a difference. And then the Bible also teaches us that the resurrection actually helps us appreciate what we have. It helps us appreciate what we have. So when we're constantly striving for more, when we're in survival mode, uh, when we're in clutching to everything we have, we wind up not really appreciating. In fact, we depreciate the things that we have. And there are things, wonderful gifts that we have in our life that we overlook every day. We don't even realize what these incredible gifts are often until we lose them. For example, the gift of family. And I, maybe you're sitting here and going, oh, well, maybe some people's family is a gift, but mine, that's not a gift. That's something else. And uh, what I would tell you is, first of all, in some cases that's true. There are some families that are so horribly broken and dysfunctional that almost no good comes out of it. And I wish that wasn't so, but that's part of the broken world we live in. But I also know that that's not true for most people. Our families are mixed bags, and there's some good and some not so good. 
And when you look at other people's families and you go, oh, they have such a good family. I wish my family were like that. Might I suggest to you, maybe they're just doing a better job pretending than your family is. Because like, that's how that works. Or friends. Oh, other people have better friends than I do. Or your health. Or the fact that you have access to God's presence and when you talk, he actually listens to you. These are incredible gifts, and this is why we depreciate them, because we're constantly comparing ourselves to someone who has more than we do. Give up that rat race. There's always going to be someone who has more than you do. I don't know who the person is who actually has the most, but none of the, that person is not in this room. You don't know them. And when we constantly compare ourselves to those who have more, all we do is depreciate what we have. Do you know what's true? Right here in this room, we have more than most of the world. That's what's true. And we who have been given so much often don't appreciate it because we're frustrated that somebody else has more. You can actually, the resurrection helps you appreciate what you have. And then lastly, it helps to reduce discouragement. This is a really big deal. It helps to reduce discouragement. By the way, I have two life verses. One is in Matthew 16, and this is the other one in 1 Corinthians 15. This is what it says. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing what? Let nothing move you. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves, what's the next word? Fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. As soon as we think that what we do doesn't matter, we just give less. We do less. We put less energy and effort into it because what difference does it make? It's never going to change. We kind of buy into that thinking. But here's what I want you to understand. The only way that you can waste your life is if you do nothing. The only way that you can be defeated as a follower of Jesus is if you surrender. You can't be defeated any other way. Every single step you take, every single action that you engage in, it is used by God. And he is going to, in this process, build a story into your life that's breathtaking of his grace and glory and of your purpose that he, uh, his purpose that he has for your life. That is what God wants to do. God is using situations you are in right now. His purpose is not going to be thwarted. His plan is not going to fail. His resurrection power can actually animate you to step up and step into the things. Sure, it might not be fun. Sure, it might be confusing. Maybe you don't know how it's going to work out, but you are not stuck. Resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same resurrection power that you have available to you. And how it looks in this world, resurrection power looks like transformation in day-to-day -day living. That's how it looks. So, I'm going to end with this uh, little story. Has anybody seen the animated Pixar short film called Piper? I'm, 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 I'm the only one, like, in all the services. I don't get this. And it's Pixar. Like, like, everybody watches that stuff. So, okay, here's the story. It's a story, it's a coming-of-age story about a little sandpiper. He's called, and that's why he's called Piper. And it's this little baby sandpiper bird sitting in the, in the grasses of the beach. And his life is so wonderful because all he has to do when he's hungry is just lift his mouth to the sky, open it wide, and then his mother comes and brings him something. I mean, isn't that wonderful? That's what some people think being wealthy is like. You know, that's the perfect life. You just lay there and, and someone gives you whatever you need. And so, and then one day she decides... Not to do that. And so she flies down to where the water is, and she pulls the food out of the sand, and he go, he's all excited, he's, he's ready, and, and she eats it. And he's annoyed. And maybe he didn't see her, so she didn't see him. So she, he just he does that a couple more times, and nothing, nothing. And so he gets hangry. Has anybody else been there? He gets hanging, and so he's running down to the shore, and, and, and he gets next to her, and he opens his little mouth, and then, goes, okay, I'm here. Give me the food, and she, she won't do it. She eats her food herself, but she shows him how to get the food out of the, 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 the shoreline, 
And so he tries it, and it works. Oh, this is great. But as little sandpipers are known to be, he wasn't paying attention. If you've ever been on the beach, how many know those birds are really good about the waves not getting them? They just go in. But he didn't see the wave coming. He was distracted. And the big wave got him. And the next scene of Little Piper that you see, he looks like he's been run through a washing machine. And he's all fluffed out, and he's quivering in fear. In fact, he develops a form of PTSD. So every wave that he sees, it just terrifies him to no end. And yet his mother will not bring him food. He's, he's over there just, you got to help me out here. And she won't do it. And finally, he works up the courage, and, and he goes down. And every wave that comes in, he just runs away. He's terrified. And, and he finally gets down there, and he discovers a couple of things. He discovers that the waves don't actually destroy you, that you're bigger than they are. And he discovered there's actually more provision than you could possibly ever need, and you can share it with others. And you discover that you are not just created to sit in the grasses of life and have someone drop something into your mouth that may satisfy your appetite for food, but it does not satisfy your appetite for the discovery of who you were created to be. You don't discover who you are by sitting in the grasses and let someone else feed you. You discover who you are by taking steps that feel like risk and you face your fears and you face the waves. And that little bird slept the most blissful sleep that night because he discovered there was more to him than just a little nest creature. And that's what the resurrection does for us. There's more to you than just an appetite or a need. You are a son and a daughter of the living God. And he wants you to face waves. He did not promise there would be no waves. He wants you to face the waves. And he wants you to discover this abundant provision that he offers that allows you to recklessly share with other people so that they too can discover the grace of God. Let's bow our heads this morning. Man, if, if you have been dinged up and disappointed, it, it's hard to even sit through a talk like this. And somehow you feel that's, that's for the, the other folks. Maybe life works for them, not for me. And the first thing I want you to know is it doesn't work for anybody. We all get dinged, and we all get disappointed, and we all get defeated. That's what this world does to us. If it hasn't happened to you yet, spoiler alert, it's coming your way. And yet the resurrection power of Jesus reminds us that we are not destined to sit in the grasses on the sidelines, just try to survive or indulge. But there's a destiny we've been called to live into, and it starts when you take those steps and you face your fears and you trust that what God can do in you and through you is greater than just sitting on the sideline. It makes all the difference in the world. So Father, help us. We are fearful creatures. But the fact that you defeated death is inspiring us to take some risks, to take some steps of faith, to actually trust that you have a purpose and a plan for our lives that is greater than what we have realized to this point. Pour that courage into us and help us live in the power of that resurrection today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.